Amen. Let's pray that the one whose name has drawn us here, that, that, that we would be open ears. Lord Jesus, let us have open ears this day. Open ears, attentive hearts. God, that, that, that we would be ready and willing to hear what you have to say to us. Because God, we believe that, that you are working not just in a general way, but here, in me, and all of us here today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're almost done with Ephesians. We just have two more weeks. And you're firmly now in the middle of the second half of the book. I bet some of you probably could tell, could stay up here right now and, and, and say what the two halves of the book are, right? The first half of the book, Paul is really careful. He lays out all the the, what it is to be a Christian. Our, our core identity. Who we are. And then after he takes three chapters, he takes a second half to say, okay, now that we've established who we are, let's talk about what we do. Identity comes before activity. Paul intended this this way. Something that we should keep in mind. But now we're in the part where we are talking about what do we do? How do we live out this calling that we have received? This calling to, to be Christians. Literally little Christs. What does it look like to, to live that out? Let's listen. Let's listen. Would you listen with me? We're in Ephesians 5. We'll begin in... Um, in verse 20, and we'll go through 6, verse 9. This is a long chunk, okay? I realize that. So hang with me. You can find the version that I'm reading in your bulletin, okay, that's printed out. But I also want to encourage you to pull out the, um, the NIV, um, either maybe one that you brought or the one that's in the pew. Um, I encourage you, if you can, have both of those open at the same time. And as always, this is God's word. So do whatever it takes to listen well, to have your heart be open, to know what the Spirit of God is teaching us today. Starting in verse 20. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And submit to each other out of respect for Christ. For example, wives should submit to their husbands as if to the Lord. A husband is the head of his wife, like Christ is the head of the church, that is the Savior of the body. So, wives submit to their husbands in everything, like the church submits to Christ. And as for husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He did this to make her holy by washing her in a bath of water with the word. He did this to present himself with a splendid church, one without spot or wrinkle on her clothes, but rather one that is holy, one that is blameless. That's how husbands ought to love their wives. In the same way that they love their own bodies. Anyone who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds it, takes care of it, just like Christ does for the church, because we are part of his body. This is why a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two of them will be one body. Marriage. Marriage is a significant allegory. And I'm applying it to Christ and the church. But in any case, 
as for you individually. Each one of you should love his wife as himself. And wives should respect their husbands. As for children, obey your parents and the Lord because it is right. The commandment, the, the commandment, honor your father and mother, is the first one with the promise attached. So that it may go well with you. And that you will live for a long time in the land. And parents, parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them with discipline and instruction in the Lord. As for slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, and with sincere devotion to Christ. Don't work to make yourself look good or try to flatter people, but act like slaves of Christ by carrying out God's will from the heart. Serve your owners enthusiastically as though you were serving the Lord and not human beings. You know that the Lord will reward every person who does what is right, whether that person is a slave or a free person. And as for masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Stop threatening them, because you know that both you and your slaves have a master in heaven. He doesn't distinguish between people on the basis of status. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We are in a, a, a time of uh, our family's life, right? family's life, our family's life right now, um, where where we're learning knock knock jokes. <laughs> knock knock jokes, right? You know how these go. Knock knock. Who's there? Who's there? Cow. 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 I messed that up. <laughs> <laughs> sense of, of the rhythm of, of what's happening because we we get it, right? Like we know we know the joke, right? Knock knock. Who's there? To. To who? To whom? Carrie, that one was for you. <laughs> right? So we understand there's a there's a shape, right? We we know what's happening next. And because we because we get how knock knock jokes work, we know where the punchline is. Right? Like, like, after we've learned the joke, we don't get hung up on saying, like, why does he only say knock, knock, instead of knock, knock, knock? Right? Like, none of you are thinking that, because you get the joke, right? You understand how this, how this whole thing works. Okay? Yeah, Dane, you, you get it too, don't you? Yeah, yeah. The, the way the joke works sets up how we get the punchline. Scripture sometimes works a similar way. Let me explain what I mean. Sometimes there are not jokes, but ways of saying things, ways of laying things out that are in Scripture that we don't get because we're living here in Climber in 2014, right? And I've, we've got phones in our pockets, and things are really different now than they were back in the day when Paul wrote this. So there are some things, it's basically, it's almost like an ancient joke that's written in scripture that we just don't get because we, we, we don't understand. We don't understand how it's set up, and so sometimes that can keep us from missing the punchline. Now don't get me wrong, this is, this is not a joke, okay? Not a joke. Um, but, but there is something to the fact that if we understand the form, like the type of joke, if you will, the, the type of way that Paul is, is working here, it's going to help us to get the punchline. It's 
It's going to help us to get what Paul is really trying to say, right? Instead of reading through Paul and pretending that Paul wrote a knock-knock joke and getting stuck on, why, why did he not twice and not three times or not just once? I mean, maybe that means like, that we should be, you know, persistent with God, but, but not too persistent, okay? You know what I'm saying? So, so the form, let me just explain a little bit of what's going on here. What Paul is working with here, when he starts off by saying, husbands and wives and children and slaves, this is, this is something known as the household code. Okay? And the household code is everybody has these. Okay? Back in the day, if you were any kind of leader, any kind of philosopher, any kind of... Um, you, you had these things called household codes. And it was basically the way um, that you set out and said, you know, husbands, this is the way that you're supposed to act. Children, um, this, you're kind of laying out all the different the ways that that people in society were supposed to act towards each other. Okay? This actually goes back all the way to Aristotle. Um, at least. Aristotle was the first one that we know of that kind of set this out. Okay? And the reason that this is important, because I was never told this until I was in my mid-twenties, and I always thought that Paul had just kind of like written up this whole thing right off the cut, or through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? Because that's what we believe the Bible, how the Bible is, how it comes to us. But it makes a difference to know that Paul is working with, is working with this kind of a set form, kind of a set joke, right? Kind of a set form that helps us pay attention to what he's really saying. There are other household codes in the Bible, in, in, um, in Colossians 3, and Titus 2, and 1 Peter 2. Um, this is kind of the, the most elaborate one, and the, and the one where Paul goes most in-depth to, to kind of explain that not only how we should ask towards each other, but the why, the why behind it. So this is, this is really good, it's a really good one um, to work with and to study. The first thing that you need to know about other people that wrote household codes is that they only addressed the men and the people that were in power. Other household codes, well, they just didn't. They didn't talk to the um, the people that were that were assumed to be, um, you know, on the on the lower rung. And and this, it, when Paul was writing this, it was very, very, very obvious who was on the lower rung. Um, if you were a woman, you were, you were just, you just weren't, the, you just literally weren't uh, equal in, in any way, shape, or form. You could you had no public voice. You, um, you, uh, you were just inferior, inferior in every way. And that's just the society that, that we were living in, that Paul was living in. That's why when anyone wrote their own household codes, they didn't really worry about it talking to the women or the children um, or the slaves or anything that it was all about masters here's how you here's how you get your slaves to, to behave husbands here's how you keep your wife in line right like that's the that's the force of everyone else's household codes okay are you getting are you getting a little bit why it matters to know that there's a that there's a pattern here that Paul is following Paul isn't throwing everything out but what he is doing is something extremely significant He's doing something extremely significant to the point where he's almost, almost entirely upending this whole notion that was so, so could not have been stronger in his culture. That women are by nature deeply inferior to men. There's something, do you have your NIVs out? Mm -hmm. There's another interpretation, interpretive kind of Bible study sort of thing that, that I just want to point out, okay? Um, and today I started in, in verse 20, okay? I really could have started back in verse 15, because that's kind of the beginning of Paul's thought here. Verse 20, Paul's like right in the middle of things. And, and one thought is connected to the next.
especially verse 21 and verse 22. Now again, I I grew up reading the NIV mostly, and so I when I read Ephesians 5, I saw it laid out the way that you see it in your NIV. Do you see it there? Where's the break in the NIV? Between which verses? 21 and Between 21 and 22, right? How does it change the way you hear Ephesians 5? If you start, if Paul is starting a fresh new thought in verse 22, <laughs> as opposed to if verse 22 Stop. is the next the next sentence that is linked up with the sentence before it. How, how would that change the way we read the text? Well, I'll tell you something. There, uh, the word submit in verse 22, for example, um, wives should submit to their husbands as if to the Lord. I was using some Greek word, and I'm getting ready for the sermon, and I was... I was trying to, I was actually looking at the difference between the, the word submit here in verse 22 and the word obey that Paul uses later on in relation to children. And I was looking for it, and, and I was looking for it, and I was, I was looking for that word submit in verse 22, and it's not there. The word submit is, is not in verse 22 in the Greek at all. So then why would the translators have put it there? Well, it's because Paul meant it. It's the sort of thing that you that you catch, right? But Paul intended to refer to it, but he didn't put it in the sentence. I would argue because that's not the start of what he's saying. That's not the main thing. The main thing you can see in the verse before. This is where the verse submit comes in. Verse 21. Submit to each other out of respect for Christ. That's where the word actually is. Submit to each other out of respect for Christ. And then he kind of goes on to flesh that out. So, for example, wives, submit to your husbands. As if to the Lord. Well, that's a big reason. Submit to your husbands, not because it might not go so well for you if you mouth off. No. Submit to your husband as if to the Lord. Why do we submit to the Lord? Do you know why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Paul goes on to, to expand on that and to talk about the relationship of, of husbands and wives and then specifically putting it in the context of of Christ and the church. Again, as we as we look at this though, one way of looking at this to say that as Paul teases out this difference between husband and wife being like between uh, Christ and church, they say, well obviously Jesus is in charge, right? Right? Like from the church's perspective, Jesus is the one that's in charge, right? Probably what Paul is saying mostly is that wives don't forget that Jesus is in charge, right? Let's look what Paul actually says. Um, in verse 29, this is the center of where he's. Paul really kind of comes out and names it very, very, very clearly. No one ever hates his own body. But feeds it, takes care of it, just like Christ does for the church, because we are part of his body. Christ takes care of the church because we are part of his body. Have you ever um, come... I don't know. After doing something really physically intense, like maybe maybe you're you know coming in um, 
you know, after you know, out from the field someday, or, may, or maybe you're coming home from a, um, you know, a long practice, right? Um, a really intense workout, um, and a little bit later, man, you're hungry. Right? You know what that feels like? That like, it almost feels good, right? If you know that there's food there, that like that like ache in your gut, oh, I'm so, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And what do we do? We get some food, right? Because we take care of our bodies. We know, we know in this way what our bodies need, and so we take care of them. You don't wait for somebody to say, hey, Evan, are you hungry? Right? No, Evan's like, man, I'm hungry. Let's get some food, right? That's the way that Christ cares for you, in that kind of way. He knows what you need without needing to be told. Christ cares for his church because we are part of his body. I should have broken this up into two weeks. Um, Go ahead. So here we are. Um, in case I haven't made um, everyone upset yet, here's something. As for children, obey your parents and the Lord. That word children um, has nothing to do with age. <laughs> Paul, if Paul meant like little kids, obey your parents, there was a different word he could have used for that, but he didn't use that. He used the, gen- the generic, like, I am my, my parents' child, tecton. That's the word he used. And then there's this bit about slaves. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? I'll tell you what I think. I think that it's our task as Christ Church to receive Holy Scripture as God's Word to us today. When we read the Bible as a Bible, as the whole of it, which is which is something that we do, which is important, not to just kind of cherry pick out your favorite verse and put it in the coffee mug. When we read the whole Bible, we come across stuff that, and if you're not uncomfortable, you're not reading. When we read the Bible, when we read the Bible on its own terms, listening to what God has for us, if we do not sometimes hear a word that takes us off guard, that pushes us left of, or right of center, I didn't mean anything political, that doesn't push you, that doesn't move you off center, then we're not reading the Bible. Because God is, has something to challenge us, each and every one of us, no matter how long we have been living or studying and loving the Lord. When we read Scripture on its own ter- on God's terms, we should come as one writer once put it, just come with our heart hats on. Our utility belts, because this is not light reading. This is not fluffy stuff that, man, I need a little boost in my day, so let me read the Bible and I'll get some more fuzzy. That's not what we're doing here, people. When we read the Word on God's terms, it is beautiful, and it is life. But it also calls things out in us that we sometimes wish we didn't have to deal with. So the challenge as Christians is not to say, will we follow the Bible? The question is, how? How how do we do this? It's not always 100% cut and dry. But that's the beauty of what we get to do together as a church. It's not just one person. It's not just me standing here dispensing all of my you know, pastorly wisdom saying this is the way everything is and you just kind of write it all down and then we're all done. No, that's not how it works. God, God is working among the church uh, through individuals too, but through the church as a whole. That's how God is working with this Holy Spirit. So in part today, 
kind of don't want to sew everything up entirely. But I want, I hope that you're asking some questions about Ephesians 5 that you weren't asking before you came in. I hope you are. And I hope that that you will go home and that you will wrestle through them and that you will ask God, God, what are you telling us today? What, 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 are, you, what are you telling us? Submit to each other out of respect for Christ. I believe this is the verse that sets off this entire household code. Submit to each other. Why? Out of respect for Christ. Our interactions with each other, our inter- no matter who we interact with, our every interaction is one that Paul says must be in dialogue with reverence to Christ. Let's work on that, Michelle. How do you do that today? Let's do that. Let's do that. Because that's what God's calling us to do. That's what God's calling us to do. I'm glad that I'm not doing this alone, but I thought we could do it today. Let's keep on listening to what God has for us today. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would give us patience and attentiveness to this, your word, that we would honor it and respect it. Fill us, Holy Spirit, and enable us to to live the life that you've called us to. And all God's people.